We all live with shame. And I'm not just talking about that secret guilt you carry around for a little sin you committed. I'm talking about something deep within that paralyzes people, that keeps them from relationships, that keeps them from reaching their full potential, that keeps them from just being themselves and resting. And this is a very old problem. How old? Well, this is from uh, the book of Genesis. The first words that people ever spoke. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. From the very beginning, we've been dealing with this shame, this I want to hide myself. There's something wrong inside. Welcome to the Chris Stefanik Show. We're going to define shame, help you maybe start to uncover some of the shame you're living under that God does not want you to live under the dominion of. And we're going to help give you some tools for, for what to do about it. Um, and I'm so blessed to be joined by Carrie Shoots Daunt. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks, thanks, for, for, thanks for being here. And thanks for giving your life to this, to this work. Um, before we dive into shame, which, which you have kind of, I don't know if you've intended to become an expert on oh, yeah, this. Yeah, I'm an expert on shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you tell people when you meet them at the doctor's <laughs> office or out to dinner. <laughs> that's right. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm an expert on shame. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, uh, that's, there's an awkward uh, thing to be an expert on, but it's awesome because um, people need that. But be before we dive into that particular area, all right, the sa shame is one of seven wounds people live out of. Yeah. Give us a brief overview of these wounds, and we don't have to go into them in great detail, but I, I, I like dropping things that as people watch, they might hear, oh, and just like it hits them. It's, it, if God does that to you while you're watching, if, if your psyche does that to you while you're watching, lean into that, because maybe this is one area that you got to lean into. So uh, what are the seven wounds that people live out of? Yeah, so um, you know, my dad, uh, Dr. Bob Schutz, um, actually took uh, this idea that um, Dr. Ed Smith had about these these wounds of the heart, so to speak, and um, and simplified them into these seven deadly wounds. We called them um, kind of correlating to the, the deadly sins. Mm, the see. seven deadly wounds are, uh, of course, shame, hopelessness, confusion, um, powerlessness, and then we have rejection and abandonment and um, fear. And fear. Yeah. Say this one more time. I want to. Go, I want to say them slower. Okay. Because I really want them to sink into to viewer psyche. Yeah. And, and and I I love that you call them deadly wounds, uh, because there's long before we talked about deadly sins, of uh, the church fathers, the desert fathers who would go and, f and they didn't flee the world to get away from things, but to f go in the front line in their mm -hmm. spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. They talked about deadly thoughts. Mm. Uh, and and this this hits hits that same thread, right? There's there's deadly thoughts. There's deadly wounds. There's things that our sins arise from that I, I don't know what happened in the church. Maybe it's maybe it's that missionaries encountered cultures where they just had to really lean into behavior modification of, <laughs> because it was such a mess. It's like, you guys, please stop having orgies. We can't function as a society if you're not going to be faithful to your wife and, and, and you're going to be sacrificing uh, kittens all the time. Like, behave, right? Yeah. Uh, so so they, they lean into that very heavily. But before that, Right, uh, and so that's, that's a profound thing to, to think about. So repeat those one more time, and I, I just I just want you to think about these because you probably have one of these you're living. Out. You definitely have one of these you're living out of. So what are they again? Yeah. So abandonment. Abandonment. Rejection. Rejection. Hopelessness. Hopelessness. Powerlessness. Powerlessness. Fear. Fear. Confusion, confusion and shame. And shame. Yeah. So we're all living out of some some wound or other. Yeah, or several. Sometimes we like to, you know, yeah. have a few I, in our pocket. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably, I'm probably juggling them throughout the day. Yeah. Uh, the shame one. This one can almost seem childish or soft to some, or, uh, or they'll reduce it as, oh, I'm just being scrupulous about some little thing I did, that maybe I just have to get over the church. The church is always guilting and shaming people, right? It, it's far more deep and encompassing than that. Uh, what is shame? So shame at its core, at its very essence, uh, you know, like you said in the very beginning, was something that happened to us right from the beginning, you know, right in the Garden of Eden, um, in this encounter when, in Genesis where um, Adam and Eve, in their, in their places of, of, of their sin, wanted to hide. They wanted to hide. And so in some way or another, at some point in our lives, each of us, uh, have have had that experience of of wanting to hide, wanting to not be visible or um, to be seen, or to have those experiences of feeling like I'm too much or I'm not enough, um, mm. and that is at our very core, very essence of of the places where right from the beginning our first parents mm. um, had that same feeling of I, I don't want God to see me. I don't want. They didn't want to see each other even in mm. that place 
because of it was too painful. Mm -hmm. And really the painful part of it was it wasn't as, as, as it was intended. You know, like here they are in this moment. I always think about this, this profound moment of Adam and Eve are in this fullness of communion with one another. They see each other, they beheld each other, and they're, they love each other in the sense of their, it's beyond the bodily reality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this full communion that they're experiencing in the garden with God, you know, and, and the Holy Trinity. And then in the next moment, this moment by moment change, they eat this fruit and then all of a sudden they wanna hide. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't wanna be seen. And, I, and the experience of not wanting to be seen is, is, is because it's too painful you know, the reality of how it should be and what it is, you know? And I think so many of us have experienced that because we live in a broken world, mm. that the reality of what we desire, what our hearts, what we're made for, you know, because we are the children of God mm. and what we're living out of don't match. And so mm. we don't want to be seen in those places and or want to see, you know, or know how to see. I, I, as you're talking, I'm seeing in, in your eyes that this comes from, this isn't just an academic topic for you. Yeah, no. Um, why, why were you driven to, to lean into this topic? You know, um, for many years I've been doing prayer ministry for the John Paul II Healing Center. And one of the big joys of my life is being able to watch people walk into deeper freedom. Mm. And as I prayed, um, particularly um, with women over the years, I would sit down and, and we would begin to pray. And before they told me um, their shame story, which almost every woman had one, and it was really the thing that was mm. the first layer a lot of times of their woundedness. And um, before they would share this, they would say, I'm the only one who's ever felt this way. And I can't share Like, I don't mm. even want to share because I felt this way. And what I began to see in this, this pattern is that, that this is the way that the enemy <laughs> wow. is shrouding women from living out the fullness of who they were and who they're called to be. And I would argue that the same is true for a man as well. Um, but the way that it's manifested, and particularly in women, has just been this, um, this pattern that's happened even since the garden with Eve, you know, just this, this need to hide and just feeling like I'm the only one who feels this way. And, and what do we do out of that? You know, how do we live? And, and it ceases, as women, I think in a particular way, we reflect uh, aspect of God's glory. You know, we're made in the image and likeness mm. of God's glory. Like we're I made agree. for beauty. Amen. And I think that the, the, what happens with shame and particularly with women, what I began to see is that when we hide, we're no longer reflecting that aspect of who God is, you know, we're, mm. we're keeping ourselves shrouded in the places where we're called to shine, to, to offer God's mm. glory to the world that's so desperate for beauty. You what, know? what are some things, I mean, so you wrote a book and then this, I'm not sure if you intended the theme of shame to come up again and again, or if it yes. just emerged yeah. from these women's stories. Yeah. Give, give us the name of the book and where we can get it. Yeah, it's Undone, uh, Freeing okay. Your Feminine Heart from the Knots of Fear and Shame. <laughs> what an so, awesome title. <laughs> yeah. Just the title is like, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the desire was after listening to women over mm. the years and, and really being able to walk with them into these places, uh, and it's sacred ground. It's just beautiful sacred ground to be able to walk with women and watching them encounter God and, and these places in their hearts that have been hidden, you know, most of their lives. Um, what I realized was this lie, like I said, that each of them were experiencing, that I'm the only one that feels this way, that the really the only anecdote, really the place that we can get healing is only in communion. Mm. Like, so we need to be in communion with other people and realize we're not alone because that's what they were believing first and foremost is I'm the only one that feels this way. I'm a freak. I'm a freak, there's right. So, there, there's something wrong with me. Absolutely. And yeah. so for everyone to feel that way and no one be sharing that, it felt like, oh my gosh, like how is that possible? And like the enemy, he's not creative, you know? No. He can only distort. So this, is, this mm. was his, his plot all along, right? From Adam and Eve, from the very beginning when they were wounded in the garden with this wound of shame, like, it's the distortion of who are they created for to reflect the goodness of God, His glory. And so when we mm. hide, you know, he, it's done, you know? And so the desire, I think, for this book, I know for this book came from this, the vulnerability is really the only anecdote to shame. Because when we can wow. allow ourselves to wow. share the, you know, not give our pearls to swine, yeah. but to share the vulnerable parts of our story, and you can hear someone else share and know that you're not alone, then it gives us permission to open that that door to it's, our hearts. It's literally the antidote is to do the opposite of what your shame reflex has, has conditioned you to do. Yes, right? and yeah. Y yeah. You wanna hide, stop. Well, and, <laughs> or, or to be drawn out by vulnerability. You know, mm. just, I know for me in my own journey, um, it was women who were willing to share their stories mm. that allowed me to be able to walk into those places in my own heart. And I, oh. and I found that to be true in prayer ministry. You know, when we start to share, and then I'm like the only one who has never felt that way. And I'm like, no, sister. 
you're not. Mm -hmm. You're not the only one that's felt that way. And so the book is a collection of women's testimonies, just sharing the places in which um, they were living with these knots of shame. And, um, and the invitation, and you know, is for other women to read and be able to see, oh my gosh, yeah. you know, this woman who seems like she has it all together has the same type of, of, of shame that I carried. And, mm. and God has used that in beautiful ways to restore. How awesome. Yeah. I, I'm in a group with a, a small group. With, I'm in a handful of small groups. I'm addicted to small groups. It's so <laughs> good. It's so good for the soul. <laughs> uh, but one of them, uh, so my wife started a, a sex abuse survivors group where women get together and it's not therapy, but they're just, it's kind of like an AA meeting. They're just getting together and sharing their stories. Mm. And, uh, and then we started a guys group for the husbands uh, who are, yeah. Her spouses of survivors who have stood the ground with their with their brides, mm -hmm. and it, it's it started to become one of the most meaningful sharings in, in my mm -hmm. life because it feels like this this brotherhood of people who have been through trench warfare <laughs> and we're like yes. here we are we're, yeah. we but the most healing part was to hear and to uh, the the same exact trends and sh and secret shames and everything and as you hear it in a way that even therapy can't do uh, it, it was just wow you're you. You do, you feel that I'm normal. Yeah, like I'm not the only one. Yeah, yeah. so it, it just takes that demonic lie that I'm so weird or mm -hmm. there's something wrong with me and just, whew, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, kind of, it's kind of simple in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but, but the sexual abuse thing, there's an obvious, I think a lot of people when they hear the word shame, they go right to, to sex mm -hmm. or sexual sin or abuse or some dysfunction. What are some other sources of shame that, that creep in and it always has the same expression of hide yourself, right? But what are some other sources that maybe aren't as obvious to people? Yeah, I mean, just to to, to begin with that, the sexual sin, I mean, I, I think living in our culture today, we can't avoid mm -hmm. having some sort of shameful experience, unfortunately. I mean, yeah, thankfully, yeah. I mean, not everybody has an experience of sexual abuse, although I would say it's probably as high as 60% um, in our culture Unreal. today. Um, but I would say like even watching certain shows on television, reading magazine, yeah. billboards, you know, anything, you know, at a commercial during the Super Bowl, you know, it's, there's some sort of level of sexual assault in some yeah. of these images even. Yeah. So that there's, we can't escape the sexual part, even if, you know, we don't necessarily have a memory of, yeah. of sexual abuse or, or that kind of um, no, it's, it trauma. Assault, it assaults people. Yeah. And it goes yeah. right to the shame center. Right, right. Yeah. And, and we're so um, desensitized to it as a culture, you know, as in so many ways. But the other, the other pieces of shame, I think, that, that we tend to kind of dismiss or not see is, is just the places, like, it could even be a small thing, you know, in school where kids made fun of other kids or, mm -hmm. um, you know, just maybe you went through puberty before everybody else went pu for, through puberty. Or well, maybe you you're the last. Right, <laughs> right. But, right. Or you're right. the last one to go through puberty, you know, yeah. and, 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 and just these, uh, uh, you know, uh, obvious things that are happening. For us, we feel like that they're in the end of the world, you know. And once we feel that way, it doesn't matter if it's... Yeah. It's, if it's reality or not, it just starts to operate in us and... And, and it's how where we live out of, yeah. There, there, there's, I mean, I, I also want to drop this, this different sorts of shame, like I, maybe I eat too much. And any vice can lead to shame, right? Right, right, uh, right. I don't clean well enough. Right. My house is messy. Or, or Susie's house is nicer than mine, you know? Like, yeah. she must have it all together. Or her kids are, you know, well-behaved and mine are crazy, you know? Or <laughs> whatever it yeah. is that we feel so different from everybody else instead of, like, recognizing it or, or, or being able to see it as, like, it becomes our shame instead of huh. somebody else's you know, it may be their glory, you know, or yeah, whatever so if I can it enjoy is. what they have that yeah, you don't, yeah, <laughs> frankly. Yeah. Um, why is this a default? Why is it so dang easy to fall into? <laughs> because it's been happening from the beginning of time. You know, each of us, we, we want, we want to be seen, you know, it's our, it's our, it's our desire to be seen. We want to be known and we want to be loved, but the world, the world isn't always have the capacity to receive us in that way. And so when we have this deep desire to be seen and to know and to be loved, and we're not, you know, mm. all we want to do then and re respond is to withdraw, right? To hide. And, and it's, it's the exact thing, though. You know, I had this analogy years ago when I was beginning to teach this. Like, my husband and I, we did this huge remodel on our house. You know, we started off when we built the house. We had three kids, and now we have nine. Yeah, you know, yeah. it just didn't fit us anymore. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when we, when we did the house, we did all of these, you know, wonderful additions, and we didn't remedy a problem that we had before we even started the addition, which was mildew in our master bathroom. Like we just forgot yeah, about yeah. it. And the reason we forgot about it because it was in the back room and really no one ever went in there, no one saw it. Mm. 
And so, so often in our lives, like we have these places, right, that, that you know, whether they're our junk drawers or <laughs> our garages or our attics. Or the spiritual junk drawer, right, whatever right, it is. Right, yeah. in, our, in our hearts yeah. that, um, that we just close off. That we just are pretend mm. that aren't there, and and really, what's it just feels safer that way because it's too messy for anyone else to see, and so I'm just going to keep it hidden. But what happens when we do that is our house isn't as open. You mm. know, we've closed mm. these doors in our hearts, and we fortified our hearts mm. in places where where we don't allow not even God to come mm. into them. You know, so it's just it's basic basic self protection. Yeah, and that, that kind yeah. of ruins us. And and I think there's another level too, um, especially if it's it's from a sh from a when we're really young, to internalize and to take on the ownership of, well, maybe there is something wrong with me, is maybe easier for a kid than saying, no, my dad just won't be able to love me because he's an alcoholic. Right. What's it? Right. I mean, no five-year-old brain can process that. It'd be a lot easier for a five-year-old to say, it's probably my fault. What's wrong with me? Yeah, there's something wrong with me. It's mm -hmm. actually better than, than the truth. Mm. 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 Dang. So coming together and just acting against it and being, how, how do people do that in their daily life? Like when you start to realize, okay, I'm operating out of a shame. I, I eat too much and that's messing with me because I can't just deal with this in a healthy way because I'm associating my success or failure here with my very worth. Mm. So therefore, I shut down. I won't talk to anybody about it. Um, like if someone's hearing this right now and this is, this is pulling threads. You know, what do they do like right now? What do they do today? <laughs> just, you just pick up the phone and call your best friend and say, hey, here, here's what I'm dealing with. Just start talking. Like, is, maybe that is the answer. Like, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I think vulnerability is important. But I, again, I think it's like, um, you know, the reason why I wrote the book is so they could, women and men could see that other people were really dealing with this stuff. So I think it's important to plug yourself in with communion. You know, whether it be a Bible study, obviously don't share all of your stuff all at once with just anybody. Mm. Um, but I really think that, that the true antidote is always going to be communion. So like mm. finding those, those wonderful pathways to relationship and being able to find those safe places where you can be yourself. Mm. And, um, I, you know, shame is a wound and within those wounds, like they become this gaping hole for the enemy to, <laughs> to assault with all sorts of other things, lies, yeah. you know, um, vows, um, you know, unhealthy soul ties and, and those kind of things, which, which begin to twist our identity even more, you know, and yep. who we are and, and how we live out who we are in um, our daily lives. But, but really, I think that, that in those places, being able to recognize, okay, maybe I'm, I'm living out of this wound of shame, you know, and, and then to be able to say, ask the Holy Spirit, you know, what is it that I'm believing about myself? Mm. And, and these are the shame ones are, I'm dirty, I'm ugly, nobody loves me, I, you know, um, mm. something is wrong with me. Mm. And this is not it's something I'm dealing with, this is me. Right. right? It's, that, it's that. And being able to separate those two things and recognize, like, that's not the voice of God. Like, the voice mm. of God is not going to speak with that kind of condemnation. Mm. And, and just taking hold of that, like, taking that thought captive and saying, okay, if this is what I'm hearing, if this is the record that's playing in my head, <laughs> that yeah. I'm dirty, I'm worthless you know, that, that I'm not loved in those places. Like, how can I begin to renounce that? And it's a very simple process, you know. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that, that I'm dirty. And, mm. and I claim the truth in Jesus' name that, that I'm your beloved daughter and that you find yes. me pure and you find me delightful and, yes. and that you love me, you know. And, and I know it seems like a simple thing. We, we do this renunciation at our conferences and it's amazing. As soon as we do it, we could feel like the whole um, just demeanor in the room breaks. It's oh, like something spiritual crazy. that was there that was like shrouding oh, all yeah. of these women. And it's amazing then the day after they come and you could see their beauty, like you could actually see it. It's like yeah. profound. Oh, it, it, the, the first time I, I prayed like that, I literally felt like I had no idea there was a 50 pound weight on my back. Yeah. I yes. had no idea. Yeah. Like, and, and I think literally you're physically feeling the weight. Uh, whoo, so I, I'd say, that, so a couple steps, wake up to the fact that you might be living in some secret shame, yeah. right? Uh, try to name it and identify, renounce it out loud. Like, it, cause you know, if, if you're dealing with, uh, again, go to, go to eating or sexual sin, if that's translating to a lie that I am inherently dirty, weak, can't, can't do anything better, I, I'm not good enough, renounce that, claim the opposing truth, and then get in community, talk to people. There are such simple paths forward to, to radical freedom. And I think a lot of people are like, no, 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 it can't be that simple. Yeah, well. Can, can we make it more difficult? <laughs> why, why do you want to make it more difficult? Just do the simple things. 
Yeah, and I think so often it becomes our identity, these yeah, lies. Yeah, it becomes yeah. who we are, and so it's hard for us to be able to tease that out. Yeah. And so being able to reckon, like you said, begin to pull the threads. Oh, maybe that isn't God's voice. Maybe mm. that's there's something more to it. Mm. Man. Okay, how do we balance this with, with um, I guess, healthy shame? I think some people feel the internal shame, want to blame the church for the, for the teaching that there's such a thing as sin. Mm. And they throw the baby with the bathwater. I saw an interview uh, with Madonna. It must have been 10 years ago, but it stuck in my head, where, where she said, I'm, I don't regret a single thing I've ever done in my entire life. And the whole audience exploded in applause. Like, mm. what are you talking mm. about? Mm -hmm. Like, if, you, if you've ever hurt somebody, you don't regret that? Mm. But that, that seems to be the antidote, is this, this, um, this counterfeit to actual redemption. So what, what's a healthy shame? How do you sit in a healthy, maybe shame's not the right word when it's healthy, but what's the healthy uh, version of this well, so, been, to help us discern the difference between the two? Yeah, I mean, obviously what Madonna's expressing is this form of shamelessness, you know, mm -hmm. which our culture's mm -hmm. just fallen prey to, you know, like mm -hmm. not anything goes, anything's okay. Um, I, I mean, I would think the virtue on the other side of that would be prudence, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. not yeah. giving your pearls to swine, like being able to really recognize the gift and the 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 amazing way in which we're created and mm. how we image God. And so the when we, you know, our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit and anything yeah. that we do. Um, mm -hmm. And so anytime that we violate that place, it's a violation of our of our our communion with God. Mm. It's a violation of, of who we are and who we're created to be. And so um, it, it we that discomfort that discomfort is that violation, you know, just in that place. And the so discomfort is the violation of the image of God in us. Yeah, and so it's mm. just the the opportunity to recognize, like, okay, I've I've fallen out of this place. Like, mm. how can I how can I restore that? How mm. can I get back to the place where I'm in that communion again? So the yeah. antidote's a healthy repentance yeah. that comes not from beating yourself down and building yourself up and realizing I didn't live up to the beauty. Yes, it's yes. not it's not I'm bad and I lived out of the badness that I am. Right. I didn't live up to the beauty. Uh, one of one of our most profound parenting experiences. I gotta give credit to Natalie for this. My, my, uh, one of my kids, um, he had found this phone that was broken, this cracked screen that we had deactivated. Like I, I have no idea, this was evil, right? <laughs> but he fell into watching porn on this phone mm -hmm. at a really mm -hmm. young age. And um, he felt so ashamed. Mm -hmm. And he, he wrote this note um, that he wanted my, my wife to read. And he, he didn't even tell me, he just wanted her to read it. Mm. Um, and he's like, I'm, I'm, Mom, I'm going to go hide in the closet while you read the note. Oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> she said, I want you to sit here in my presence so you could watch my face and see that I still love you while I read this note. It's just so beautiful, man. It's like you, you don't have to be, when you're coming from that place of resting in the, in the love of God, it gives you freedom to say, yeah, I messed up so big time. <laughs> I, I did this, I did that, and it, it's okay. Yeah. You know? Ah, so it's, it's, it's the irony that the, that the world would say teaching about the reality of sin is the very thing that causes shame, and the church is to blame for that. And No, the truth is when you combine that with the redemptive love of God, then you realize your worth actually doesn't depend on you being perfect. Right, it's, it's not <laughs> it's, your identity. Yeah, right? it's like yes. the, you know, I'm, I'm just crying because of the beauty of the good news. Yeah. Gosh, the world needs to hear this so bad. What a beautiful thing for oh, your man. wife to be able to express with such love. And that's all we need in those places of our shame is for someone to say, I love you in this. Yes, I amen. love you in this. Amen. And like, well, that's I what see community you. does too. Yes, yeah, I see you. I have brothers, I have sisters that love me in my, in my messiness, and it's mm -hmm. all good, man. Mm -hmm. um, man. I, I think of honor cultures in the past, right? And, and I was reading this online about honor cultures the other day from the Iowa uh, State Psychological Department. An honor culture is characterized by a complex set of beliefs, attitudes, and norms about the importance of personal reputation and the necessity of protecting and defending one's reputation and social image. So there's entire cultures that have been founded on this idea. Mm. Uh, you, a great example is, uh, is seppuku, Harry Carey, right? Uh, that that the warrior in Japan, it was such an intense honor culture. You dishonor yourself, you can get it back by disemboweling yourself. <laughs> you literally put a knife in here, rip it across your stomach, uh, and that's how you die with your honor intact. Then there's honor cultures like Achilles and Hector, right? Mm -hmm. Like 
I'm going to pound my chest. We can solve this entire war by our two greatest warriors coming out and fighting. And, and there's something very twisted about that. But at least they had a way of saying, look, even if I die, I can die at minor intact. Mm. There's something so weird about this culture that's denying sin, blaming the church for shaming people. Um, and then it's this honor culture on crack mm. where there's people's reputations thrown out because of social media where there's no redemption. Yeah, you're canceled. It's an honor culture with no redemptive path. Mm. We just cancel you, you die dishonored. No matter what you do, it's over. You said X 20 years ago, it's, it's over. Mm. And we, we seem to revel in this. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know, how, how, would you, how would you respond to that? And how, how are you seeing that in, getting worse in, in the ministry you're doing? Uh, uh, it's interesting, you know, I think about like, I just want to tell people to unplug. But yeah, anyway, unplug. So yeah, yeah. Yes, unplug. Obviously, yeah. Yeah, you know it's. Uh, but I also think like, if we don't know who you are and whose you are, right? It's easy to get lost. Who you are and whose you are. Yeah, and mm. it, it's so easy for us to get lost. You know, if you if you didn't have someone giving you direction, if you didn't have someone telling you that you were doing a good job, then of course it's going to be difficult to be able to stay on the in the right path. Mm. And and so it's so much of again going back to that that whole idea about communion, like. We are beloved. We are God's beloved. We are sons and daughters. That's who our identity. And so often we take on the identity of everything else besides beloved. Mm. We take on the identity of, of, of shame or hopelessness or, or of our abandonment or the places of our parents' divorce or our, you know, our, our sexual abuse or, or even, you know, our, our vanity instead mm. of the truth of who we are and who we're created to be. And mm. when we live out of that place, when we know who we are and whose we are, we can become, um, this beacon of hope and light for other people. And when we're not hiding, when we're not, you know, running away and sitting in the closet, <laughs> yes. um, but sharing the gift of, of that grace, then, then the vulnerability itself is invitation, you know, to come and to go, to go deeper into those places and to realize like, Amen. I'm worth it. You've gone through this journey yourself. What's it feel like to be you on the other side? Right. I mean, not that we're over, ever done with the battle. You still right. have to renounce lies on a regular basis. Right. But I just want to give, give a word of hope because you've obviously been through stuff. Everybody has where you've come out. And it's like, I'm not dominated by shame anymore. Yeah, it's amazing. It's How like, is it? It's like this whole new lease on life. You know, it's like finally you can live in a greater fullness of who you are. Mm. Like, because that's all shame does is shroud. It only hides and covers us. And so whatever part of us is is not seen it's missing a, an aspect of God's glory that He wants to reflect through each of us. And so for me, for myself, um, you know, growing up, I, I always felt like I'm the only one who, who, you know, had that weird, awkward teenage days, but it was lasted forever, five years in braces and kinky curly hair. And um, I had a learning disability, which I didn't realize had kept me isolated from a lot of the students mm. um, from a very young age and just had this always desire for belonging. and always felt like I just don't belong. I don't belong and there's something wrong with me. Mm. And um, as I had children and I realized I had all of these children at, um, all at once and no one else did, <laughs> like something is still wrong with me. We did. Right. Oh, good. Thank you, Chris. I feel so much better. <laughs> but I felt like there was something wrong with me and people would tell me that. My own family members would tell me that. My yeah. friends, you yeah. know, and so it brought up all of these things from my childhood. And mm. um, I had this opportunity to pray um, with these women, and this seems like a very simple thing, you know, there's nothing, you know, like huge trauma you would think in it. But for me, I still felt like that little girl who didn't belong. Mm. And as soon as the Lord began to reveal um, those places in, in this healing journey in my own heart of being beloved, mm. um, it was interesting the timing of the Lord opening the doors even for me to be able to mm -hmm. begin to walk into ministry and to write these books and to do prayer ministry and then to do these conferences. It was like, I've just been waiting for you to come home. <laughs> you know, like I have a mission for you. And that's true of all of us. Like each of us have a mission that God has for us. Yeah. And what the enemy wants to do is keep us shrouded in shame so we can't offer the beauty that he's designed for each one of us, our unique mission to live that out. And it's unrepeatable. It's he's like so only He's so afraid us. of you shining. He's afraid of He's, he's afraid, afraid of all us. of us shining. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. Okay, where do people get all your stuff? Yeah, um, at the John Paul II Healing Center. Um, John Paul II, like two letter J-P-I-I. -I -I. John, uh, healing John Center. Paul, I, I. Yeah, healingcenter.org. Healing yeah, yeah, and you can find um, there um, uh, all um, two of my books. The third one's coming out uh, in December, but um, sneak peek. Sneak peek. Yes, it's a uh, beloved daughter, um, beloved and God, it's a nice. children's book actually, um, written for little girls. Um, 
And it is really just this idea of speaking the truth of their identity, uh, scripture-based, of who they are before mm. the world, and all the lies can continue to inundate them um, mm. with something other than the truth. Mm. Um, and then uh, the other books that are available um, on the on the JP2 Center uh, website and our store is um, Undone, Freeing Your Feminine Heart from the Knots of Sin and Shame. And then a book my husband and I wrote together um, is uh, um, man your post learning to lead like saint joseph nice and it is um just a collection of men's stories uh about living in virtue um and and how to stand in the place where there's a big gap in this world mm. um where uh, men have abandoned their post and just an invitation to learn how to live in those virtues so, praise god i'm so grateful yeah. for it. i'm so proud of you thanks mm. for well, i mean thanks, thanks for like, being passionate about people being free mm. What a great space to, to live in and what a beautiful mission. And I'm, uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks yeah, for all the people that you're, you. you're helping liberate. You guys, too. You, you guys are doing beautiful work. Praise for the God. Yeah. The Lord loves you so much, it's ridiculous. And I love thinking about how so many things in the Bible call you beloved. But you break that apart, beloved, beloved. It takes some work to actually live in that identity, to actively be loved. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's almost easier to be at battle with the world and self-protective all the time. Dive into that work because God wants you to be free, free of, of, of shame. So free that you're actually not even uh, afraid of, of calling your sins and, and failures and things you're working on what they are. It's just stuff I'm working on. It's cool. I'm a beloved child of God. There's the context. There's the identity that, that I live out of. So keep leaning into that. Find community when you need it, right? Find community. Uh, well, actually, we all need it. Find community, period, because you need it. Uh, live in that, be, be vulnerable with people. You know, don't live out of that, that self-protective place. You want to get better? Do the opposite of what your gut is telling you to do. Uh, think about the lies you're living out of and renounce them out loud and try to claim the opposing truth. And, uh, and just when you pray, think about the Lord looking at you with great love, especially when you're repenting. Before you open your mouth and say your sin to God, think about Him looking at you with great love. I love you guys. I genuinely do. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. Share it with your friends. Same with, with, the, with the podcast, wherever you're listening to it. Make sure you, you share it around and subscribe to it. Uh, go to reallifecatholic.com. Subscribe to our newsletter so you never miss any of this stuff. And become a missionary of joy while you're there at reallifecatholic.com. Missionaries of joy, there are monthly donors who make all this stuff happen. And we pour it back into you guys in special ways. We'll see you next time.